welcome to the Your Parenting Mojo podcast. We have a bit of a different episode lined up for you today. And if you usually listen to the show with your children around, you might want to reconsider that for today because we're going to be talking about SEX. And now we have thousands of little kids around the world saying, what's (laughs) SEX? And so we were supposed to have two guests today, Chris and Charlotte Rose, uh, who are a couple and who are known as the Pleasure Mechanics. And they're also the host of the podcast, Speaking of Sex with the Pleasure Mechanics. And unfortunately, Chris is unable to join us today, but Charlotte has gamely agreed to appear with us. And we're hoping that Chris will be available on a future date to continue the conversation. So um, I found Chris and Charlotte in a really random way because I was exploring a blog post that therapist Dr. Esther Perel had written called The Seven Verbs That Shape the Way You Love. And we were looking at that in the parenting membership community because one of the important ways that we learn about these verbs is through our relationships with the with our children. Um, and, and we learned about these through our interactions with our parents. And so the most interesting and useful analysis that I found of that super short blog post was in a podcast hosted by our new friends, Chris and Charlotte. And when I started digging into their work, I realized that I wanted to explore so much more about the ways that our children learn about being in relationships, as well as about sex from us. And so I'm not just talking about the anatomically correct terminology and how to spot sexual abuse, because we've done episodes on both of those things, but how to help our children understand and boundaries and communication and pleasure in their intimate relationships. And so today we're going to focus primarily on the parents angle at this, and then we will have more guests, hopefully Chris and and some other guests as well in the future, looking at how our children learn about this and what our children are learning and what we want to be teaching them about this. So So to formally introduce them, uh, Chris, who wishes she was here, and Charlotte, who is here, have very similar bios. (laughs) Reading through their bios, they both studied sociology as undergrads, then sexological bodywork, and then somatic sexology, and then erotic massage. And they've been creating online resources on erotic education since 2006. The internet was a thing in 2006. And they're also parents of a six-year-old. So welcome Charlotte today and welcome in spirit to Chris as well. (laughs) Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And yes, Chris, it's great not to be here, but hopefully you will chat another moment. Yes, I hope so too. Awesome. Well, we are really glad to have you here. And we're wondering if maybe we can kind of ease into this topic with something that I'm guessing affects a lot of parents and maybe you're not immune from this either, (laughs) despite all of your training. And that is that sex probably isn't what it used to be before we became parents. And we actually use the term kind of broadly in our lives, BC, to mean before Karis, which is our daughter's name. And so we might say something like, oh, we used to do X, like mountain biking before Karis, BC. And of course, sex is one of those things that can fit into that framework as well. And so I'm curious with all the people that you work with, I'm sure many of them are parents, how common is this in among the people that you work with? It is so common. And I really want people to know that, that it is so normal and it makes so much sense that it is harder to prioritize sex in these early years of having kids, especially. Um, Some experts say that up to kind of when your youngest kid is four or five, that your life just is so different in this area. Um, And it makes sense. Like our focus of attention is so on this little being all of a sudden, and that changes the relational dynamics entirely in the in your family, in your relationship. Um, we just don't have enough time to take care of ourselves, to rest, to sleep. Um, you know, our hormones have changed, our experience of our body has changed, even for non-carrying parents, um, which is also interesting to think about, like, the oxytocin levels we're getting from looking at our baby is 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 nourishing in a way and we we sometimes don't need it as much from our partner um and somebody can feel left out because of that there are just hundreds of dynamics going on depending on your specific family but the the similarities are that it is extremely hard to create time um and have the energy to be able to really cultivate this part of our life mm-hmm. um And we really like to remember that there are seasons of sexuality in our lifetime and that this one is is a harder one. And partly if we can go at it knowing that that's normal and that we want to stay connected as much as possible. So when we get to the other side of that, we still want to be having sex with this person and that we feel connected and supported enough that we are interested and want to keep 
keep our sexual relationship going. I also want to tell people that like, I cannot tell you how many like late 50, 60, 70 year olds report they're having the best sex of our lives. So I also <laughs> just want to know that there is hope ahead. Um, Cause I found that really like surprising and interesting when I first um, kept hearing this, this message. Mm. Um, but one of the important things I want people to know to be able to shift this slightly and to try and increase the amount of connection and intimate connection we can be having is to really know about this idea of responsive desire versus spontaneous desire. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that has been studied and it's so important to know. So we have this cultural idea that we experience desire first and then arousal. And it, often that is how men experience um arousal, but it, that's not even always true. Um, but in reality, there is this whole, so it's sort of like a lightning bolt hits you and yeah, you're like, how oh, it I want sex. <laughs> that's how we think of, right? Like what happens in the house in Hollywood films. Like yeah. that's what we've been trained. Like that is what sex is. And anything who, anyone who deviates from that is, is, is broken or mm -hmm. not normal. And there's something wrong with you. But in reality, there's this whole other way of being with our desire and arousal where we're not that interested in sex if there's no context that is erotic. But if there is some kind of external stimulation or from our own brain, it's stimulation that is kind of sexy, then we begin to feel a little bit more arousal. And once we begin to feel more arousal, then we start to experience desire. Mm. And so this can look like if you're getting a little bit of a massage and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, actually, I, I suppose I do feel a bit more interested in this. Can we do a little bit more? Um, and it's a really simple piece of information. But I think if people understand that they might just respond to sexuality and need more erotic context to feel interested in sex and that that is a normal and totally OK, appropriate thing then I feel like we can choose to be intentional about creating more erotic context for ourselves so that we are interested in sex more. Um, and it's okay to know that it just does, it might take a lot more effort um, and intentionality to create that in our life. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because the connection with kids and family life is beautiful and rich and deep, but it is not erotic. Um, and so to, to switch gears and to find this other part of ourselves is is an effort or it can be an effort and that's normal. So mm. just to like, I want people to know that, that they're not broken <laughs> and not, there's nothing wrong with them or their libido or their relationship Yeah. to just want and need more space and time from family life to be able to step into this other part of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was thinking about what you said about, um, you know, massage. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're flexing between the English and yeah. the American pronunciations here. I usually say massage. Um, but even that can feel like, well, that's a commitment. Do I, do I want to end up doing this for the next half hour or an hour for the other person? And one of the ideas that I picked up from your work, uh, I guess, is firstly that it's not only touch that can be intimate. Um, just as I was getting ready for this interview, um, my husband came in and got the computer set up for me and got a glass of water for me and made sure I had what I needed. And that was a really connecting thing for me. And that's the kind of thing that will, um, you know, carry through into other areas of our lives. So, so it doesn't have to be touch, but it can be. I wonder if you could speak to that first. And then I want to talk about your three minute, uh, <laughs> mm. your three minute thing. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like anytime you're creating a culture of pleasure or supporting each other, taking care of each other, mm -hmm. where there's a give and take, um, that is so supportive in creating a relationship where you are supported and you want to have sex with them mm -hmm. because you're feeling cared for and nourished. Yes. And you're right, that can look like short pieces, short little sections of touch, but it can also look like the entire culture in your relationship mm -hmm. um, and doing things that kind of keep your relationship warm. Um, so that it's easier to get hot is one phrase that we use mm -hmm. um, and creating a culture of pleasure within your relationship. Like all of those acts of taking care of each other and paying attention to each other really matter mm -hmm. and they add up to a really different relationship. Um, and I think especially in these younger years of, of parenting, like that is so much of what we can offer one another mm -hmm. is that kind of give and take um, and it matters. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, something else that I, I picked up through your work is this idea of ha just having a short uh, period yeah. of time where you're available for the other person and, and it being a super short period of time. Can you tell us how you use that in your work? 
Yeah. I mean, I, you're totally right though. When you have like, it feels like a commitment to say yes to like a half hour massage or an hour massage. That is a big commitment. Um, especially when you're in this like parenting context, you're like, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Mm-hmm. But the idea of just having five minutes of massage or offering five minutes of massage, even while you're on the couch or, you know, your foot massage, your back massage, whatever, it can just make such a difference. And it really does change your hormones. It changes your experience of your body. It can begin to have you relax and you don't have to say yes to having sex, to having an hour of massage, like this small micro moments, these, they really, really, really do add up. And that's a safe thing to say yes to and cultivating in your relationship, the idea that you can have these small moments. And that doesn't mean that you are necessarily saying yes to sex is really, 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 really important because then you can say yes more often. It's sort of like, otherwise you're, you're saying yes to like, as if sex was like having one meal at a buffet, you know? And then like every time you went, you had to eat the same meal. You would just want to stop going. Whereas if you were like, it is literally a whole buffet. What can I eat this time? What do I feel like this time? What's authentic to me right now? And you can have like little bits here and there. And if you make that agreement with your partner through communication, that when you're saying yes to any kind of erotic play or any kind of erotic touch, that doesn't mean you're saying yes to intercourse. You truly can say yes more often. And those bits of warmth in your relationship, whether that's touch or connection in any way, really contribute to a more loving, connected relationship. Mm, yeah. And I think that's such a, I mean, it's, it's not the way things happen in Hollywood <laughs> in, yeah, in the movies right. that we watch. It's that, that, that never happens, right? It's, it's just, if they start kissing, you know, there's going to be intercourse at the other end. Right. Um, and so it, I think it's a complete mind shift. It, I mean, it was for me when I first heard that, that, I mean, it's almost like this idea of continual consent. Yes, I'm consenting mm. to this right now. And then I'm consenting mm-hmm. to this and you know what, I'm actually not consenting to this right now. <laughs> and that, that I can do that I mean that's completely different from the way that we think about sex in the western world not that we're actually taught that much about it beyond you know don't get pregnant and don't enjoy it too much (laughs) if you do enjoy it don't talk about it um but it I it just it isn't presented to us in that way and so the idea that we can actually uh, have that kind of relationship with another person where it can be not a constant negotiation but but almost just a I don't know. How would you say, is negotiation the right word or not? Well, I think that we often think about sex as something, it's a performance that we do right or wrong, you know? And when we start to really think about it as a mutual exploration of pleasure Mm. and something that we're curious about and like, what do you need right now in this moment? How can I, how can I support you? How can I nourish you? Mm. Um, And we think about it as this renewable resource, pleasure being a renewable resource between the two of you, <laughs> that one of you who has more energy can give you more than an- in another moment. Somebody else has a little bit more energy and can offer more. It becomes a really different thing to frame it as, as a mutual exploration where, where you're just curious. And it's like sex is adult play. And so how can we play together right now where there aren't the same rules and boundaries of like what is correct and right Um, but it truly is an exploration. It becomes much more interesting and we're able to really be real about what we are doing. Because also the thing about sex right now, especially in younger year sex, is a lot of people are having sex as an act of caretaking their partner's needs, Mm. right? And that is not very sexy Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and can be problematic if we're just like doing the sex in order to like keep our partner happy, um, which is different than valuing our intimate connection and prioritizing it and making time and effort to Mm -hmm. contribute to it. Um, But it is when we think about sex as like something that is about our own pleasure and fulfilling our own needs and our own desires and curiosities, um, the shift, it it shifts where the attention is. Mm -hmm. And it's powerful, I think, for us to really think about what do I want right now? What would be nourishing to my body? Mm -hmm. And to give time and energy to that inquiry. Um, And that helps us not be in the performance mode Mm -hmm. of just like on routine. Yeah. And if I say yes to the first step, (laughs) if I say yes to being touched, that means I want intercourse at the other end. Yeah. Um, And so it seems that that's a really key conversation to have with your partner it's Mm -hmm. not just something that you can kind of magically make happen this shift in the way that you see sex it has to be something you talk about I don't think couples talk about sex that often right (laughs) mostly (laughs) 
Yeah, I mean, we've grown up in such, uh, you know, there's 40 years of abstinence only education for yeah. adults at this point. Like, there is such a culture of secrecy and shame. And there's been so much harm and abuse that has happened in that space of secrecy and shame, unfortunately. So then when we get to our relationships, and we're trying to have intimate, loving connections, but like on top of all this misinformation, and, uh, and, and, and silence. It's really challenging. Um, and so many of us are not equipped with enough, uh, confidence or comfort just talking about sex. Mm -hmm. And it is so important. It's really challenging to think about having a really like beautiful, exquisite, delicious sex life without being able to have any conversations about what you want, what the other person wants, how to hear that request how to have boundaries around what you do and don't want. I mean, there's so many skill sets. Mm. Um, and I do want to say this is where a lot of people find it really helpful to listen to, for instance, our podcast or other sex podcasts, to be able to then discuss it with their partner so that you have kind of getting a familiarity almost with the language as well and comfort with the language to before you can kind of metabolize it and talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also have a resource at pleasuremechanics.com slash talk where there are like 50 different questions. You can have a glass of wine or a cup of tea and talk to your partner about. Because um, it's helpful to have prompts sometimes when we don't, when it's an unfamiliar subject, just to really get into those questions and really be curious about one another. Yeah, it's yeah. an uncomfortable conversation, but the more we do it, the easier it gets. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I often say Same with everything. in completely unrelated context is like saying penis or a vulva you know, to, yeah. to your child, which when you first start doing oh, it's like, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. And the more you do it, the you realize yeah. it's actually exactly. kind of scary. Um, right. So we'll put a link to those conversation starters mm. on the episode page. And yeah, I think it can be really helpful to sort of have something. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a way to hide the shame in it a little bit, right? It's like, yeah, I want to know this, but it, I'm asking because the, the question's on the list. I'm, I'm not asking because, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking about doing something that's dirty or anything like that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. I heard this on this podcast and I was wondering what you thought about that, <laughs> right? Like, that's such an easier line. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And even just the more you talk about it, like unpacking the idea, even that it's dirty, right? Like that's a whole concept and construct that we want to unlearn Anyway, even because we have been taught that we've absolutely 100% been in, we've inherited that idea mm -hmm. um, from religious institutions, from from parents, from grandparents. And it's something that is really embedded in so many of our ideas and thoughts. And how do we like pull that apart? Because it does influence and impact everything that we do with our body mm, when we feel yeah. that at a deep level. I was listening to one of your episodes um, on, I can't remember which one it was, but- Slaying shame. I know uh, it, yes, it probably was <laughs> yeah. actually. And, and how that has come to us through religion. And I was like, well, I'm not religious. I, I don't believe in, you know, I'm, I don't believe in God. Um, and so could this really have affected me? And, and your point on the show was, yeah, it really can. <laughs> can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, because these ideas really influence and impact culture. And when it impacts culture, um, it then it, it becomes ingrained in people's ideas. And then it's so brilliant. Then they make us think these ideas in our own minds, right? And so we have all integrated these ideas and they live inside our own minds. Mm -hmm. And it, to, to undo them is a whole project. It's a lifelong project. And we just need to be gentle with ourselves and know that. Um, but first we need to be able to see where our shame lives specifically. Like, what do we feel shame about? Because there's a whole beautiful, no, it's not beautiful. I'm, I'm kidding. But there's a whole range of how that shows up for people, mm -hmm. whether that's in how they feel about their own bodies, how they feel about their genitals, how they feel about their desires. You know, all of these are different flavors of shame that we each hold. And so can we look at it and then really think about where we got that from? Where did we learn that? And do we agree with it? And if we don't agree with it, can we create a different story that we then begin to live by? Mm -hmm. And this is why parenting around these subjects is so powerful, because we have an opportunity to create such a different culture for our children. So they have to unlearn so much less. Mm -hmm. And it's such a beautiful opportunity that we can't even know how how much of an impact that will have, mm -hmm. but to like raise children where there is less shame about their bodies and their genitals and having desires and expressing them and having boundaries and that consent exists, all of those pieces 
cannot be underestimated how important they are and how powerful they can be. And so as we're parenting our children in these ways, like we're also reparenting ourselves in a way and like declaring that these values matter and it's important. Um, and so I, I love that you're talking about this and including this in your, in your sphere, because these are parents that are really interested in parenting well mm -hmm. and what a beautiful aspect of life to include in that. Yeah. I mean, it's critical, isn't it? That, um, it's, it's a central part of our happiness as adults that we get essentially, I mean, we get so, so little training for any of it, <laughs> any yeah. of the stuff that really matters in life, like how to be in a relationship with another person, um, how to, how to actually take care of and nurture a baby. You don't learn anything about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and unless you had amazing parents or, you know, younger siblings where you were intimately involved in that, we, we just aren't taught any of that stuff. And, and so, yeah, the idea that there's anything, to learn about sex beyond avoiding getting pregnant <laughs> yeah. um, is is completely out of the realm of possibility in, in our current uh, education about sex. And so when we're, when we're talking about shame, uh, we sort of talked about it at a high level, and I'm wondering if we can kind of bring it down to an even a bit more practical level of um, how parents can see this showing up. And I'm just trying to think about how I think about shame in other aspects. And one way that I think about it is if I think of the words, you know, oh, I hope nobody ever finds out that dot, 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 then whatever feels in that dot, dot, dot is probably something I'm feeling shame about. Um, so, so I'm wondering if that parallel holds true. And secondly, is it, you know, sort of, oh, I, I could never ask for <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Is that another way it shows up in sex? How, how do you, uh, sort of how can you help parents to see oh yeah this is a way that shame shows up in my sexual relationships Whew. <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah um so how how shame shows up in the mm -hmm. parent sexual relationships yes, yes yeah so that can show up in a lot of different ways so common is the experience of people experiencing shame about their own bodies mm -hmm. um I mean, that is such an enormous one that consumes an enormous amount of mental and emotional energy that absolutely blocks any amount of pleasure and connection that you can be having. Mm. For because both every men time... and women, do you think people are Absolutely, men absolutely. Women? I yeah. think that we think about it more as a cultural experience for women, but yeah. as men have been um, targeted as a consumer um, class, they have been um, sold a lot of messages about how their bodies are not excellent enough strong enough masculine enough now mm -hmm. um and so i think there's a lot of a lot of concern about their own body and it specifically shows up around penis size and hardness so it's focused there um often but that is a an incredibly consuming conversation in a lot of men's minds mm -hmm. um and it doesn't need to because we know that um, women can experience pleasure from all parts of a, of, a, of, a, of a lover and that like the hardness and length of their penis is actually not significant in, in the amount of pleasure and <laughs> orgasms that people are having. Yeah. Um, because a lot of women, are, most women experience orgasm through clitoral stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, if folks can prioritize and focus on that it can take a lot of the pressure away mm -hmm. um, about penis size but yes so men and women and all folks I think have concern about their body about what the genitals look like whether they're correct um I'm using that in brackets yeah. um uh whether they look right or wrong or they're too much or too little all of that, I think, spans across all people. And then whether or not their desires are okay or too much or too little. Um, do they do they want too much is what they want kind of morally incorrect um, or different than their own self-identity? You know, like whether that's somebody who it feels like a feminist but then also wants to explore something in the BDSM realm and like have conflict about that. You know, there are all sorts of ways that we judge our we judge our interest in sexuality, but we would never judge somebody going to a horror film um, and think that that means that they're morally in, that they have a moral problem. Like we have all the, I'm actually skipping ideas because then I was thinking about fantasies, but sometimes people <laughs> think have fantasies and, and even that feels like they're, they are, they're not, they're not morally okay. Mm -hmm. And we just have so much judgment about sexuality and it just gets in the way of all of our connection because when we're focused on our brain and our emotions, we're not focusing on the connection between the two of you there. And so you're in your own isolation and therefore not getting to connect and share love and pleasure and connection. And so it really takes us out of the relationality. 
And it's a real shame because often two people are in that together um, and we're just not getting to experience as much connection and joy and pleasure as we could. Yeah. Because of these manufactured ideas about what is normal and correct. And it's such, it's so, it's so, I feel so angry and sad about it. Yeah. Um, Because it's such a waste. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much of of this that is a waste, isn't it? Of uh, the way that we're taught to think about things and show up in the world. Uh, makes things so hard for, for ourselves. So if if we are seeing, oh yeah, I, I can think of something where I feel ashamed about some aspect of my sexuality. Yeah. Um, does that, is that a beeline for the therapist or would, <laughs> is that listening to five of your episodes and then a beeline for the therapist? What kind of steps do you recommend that people take? I mean, if you have the resources and the interest in in having therapy, please do. You know, that's always going to be supportive. I think a lot of people don't necessarily have the resources or the time. And a lot of these ideas are cultural ideas. They're nothing wrong with an individual. And so that's the level that we try and work at is like having these cultural conversations because we're all in the same freaking conversation in our own minds, but we are all silenced. And so we don't know that we're all having the same thoughts in our own minds. Um, and so just the more that we're trying to have these conversations, and bring this out into the into the open so we can think about it and talk about it together and see that they are manufactured and that we are actually normal and okay and desirable just as we are. Um, we hope that 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 will be of service. Absolutely, listen to as many podcasts as you as you <laughs> yeah. desire to. And uh, yeah, we have an index so you can do it by subject so it's relevant for you because um, we all kind of have different pain points. We all have different places where it's more more painful for us than other areas and and going into it will always be of service mm-hmm. yeah I, I'm just it reminds me of something I read a while back um and I I cannot remember where which <laughs> always really really irritates me um but it it was uh, a a feminist therapist I think who was Mm -hmm. talking about how she had tried to support a client who was coming to her with um, maybe symptoms of of, uh, maternal burnout or something like that and the therapist kind of giving the culturally expected culturally appropriate uh, response rather than stepping outside of that and saying you know what the 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 way that our culture is set up does suck (laughs) that this isn't you and so I'm I'm wondering you probably need to find somebody who has specific expertise in sex therapy I would think who has taken steps to step outside of this and isn't just sort of somebody who's swimming in the junk just as much as the rest of us are who's trying to at least see outside of it do you do you find that to be the case Totally. And that's a great point. If you want to find a sex therapist specifically, um, you can look for like an ASECT certified um, sex therapist. So there are people who have done some more work and training around this subject. Um, Because you're right, it is really important for the therapist to have unpacked some of their own um, bias and judgments. Yeah, absolutely. But you're right. Also, culturally, we need to change, you know, like we need a culture of community care so that parenting isn't so, there isn't such a burden on parenting. So we don't have to have this conversation about how it's so exhausting mm-hmm. and everyone's so depleted. They don't have time to like live a full, vibrant life. Right. Because we don't take care of each other. Right. I mean, in this country, we don't have enough maternal, you know, six weeks off. You know, we could go on that whole line like there's so much there. So, yes. And culturally, we also want to change. So we're not all in the same conversation. Yes, very much aligned with a lot of things we talk about on the show, (laughs) for sure. Um, And so I want to come back to the idea of initiation and Mm. the the ways that that can create problems, because maybe sometimes I'm not in the mood (laughs) and I I just don't want to have sex right now or I don't want to like I don't even want to get on the train right now like Mm -hmm. at the first station um you have talked about uh, initiation and sort of refusal slash rejection can you tell us how you see that issue Yeah. I mean, it's such an important issue because if you think about how many moments there is refusal or rejection within a relationship over decades, how you manage that moment is going to have a significant emotional experience within your relationship. So figuring out how to do that moment well is really important for the long-term feeling state and culture within your relationship. Um, I do want to give a shout out for sex dates in this uh, having scheduled times for um, 
touch time, not necessarily saying it has to be sex, uh, sex, but just like time to connect if that's like naked cuddling or whatever, so that people can potentially decrease the amount of time there is rejection or refusal because you've agreed ahead of time. And then if we think about responsive desire, that each of you can take time to prepare yourself to be in the mood to connect, whatever that could look like for each of you. Yeah, so that is like, but again, that may not lead to intercourse at the end of it. <laughs> exactly. And having that agreement that this is like time that we might just like naked cuddle or touch, but like, we're just connect, we're having it be like an intimacy date, but not a sex date. Yeah. Cause I feel like that takes a lot of pressure off. So that's just one, one piece. Um, but then we think of rejection being like, I don't want you. And there is research um, showing that that emotion is closest to feeling physical pain in the body. So Guy Winch has a TED talk on this. Um, and it's really significant to really take in that we as humans experience rejection as it, it is as close to physical pain as an emotion can be. Mm -hmm. um, and so to understand that that moment is really powerful and significant for people. And then we think of uh, refusal as more like, I cannot do that right now because of what's going on for me. You know, so we're owning and taking responsibility that it is something about us. It's nothing to do with, I don't want you. I just don't want that right now. Mm -hmm. And bonus, if you can add, but I'm available for this, right? Like, so finding a counter offer of something that does feel authentic. Um, I am not available for sex right now, but would you like to touch and cuddle on the couch for a few minutes and just like hear about your day? You know, like what is a way you can, you can, you can transform that moment of refusal or rejection into a moment of connection that fits where you're at right then. Um, Cause that can be so important. Yeah. And uh, just to kind of translate that into language that we often use on the show around understanding what are the other person's needs. And it, especially if your partner is uh, requesting sex because they have a need for connection, then okay. sex, sex is one of a myriad of ways that that need for connection can be met. <laughs> and I think we often overlook that and, and see it as, well, th th this is what they're asking for. And so this is the only thing that's going to work. And they may even see it in that way. Like they, they may not even see their need for connection underneath that. They're asking for sex and they don't realize why they're asking for it. When we, if we can actually take a step back and see what is the actual need that I'm trying to fulfill here it's that i want to be connected to you okay well given that need there are probably 50 ways that we can list off right now <laughs> that could help us both to feel connected that don't involve any kind of penetration of anything exactly i'm so glad you mentioned that because i absolutely agree and there is a study that shows that there's 237 reasons that why people have sex mm, and I'm it, that down. I'm yeah yeah <laughs> but you're so right that of course that there are so many needs and emotional needs underneath that and can yeah. we meet those needs in other ways yeah. um, and so that's a really valuable conversation to have with your partner of like what is your why for sex and what are 10 ways i can meet those sex being one of them but what are all these other ways that would actually like nourish that emotional need um so figuring out your why and your your where that intersects with your partner is such a valuable conversation mm -hmm. um to have yeah, yeah. okay yeah. So, so let's say we are getting on the train <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> this is something we want to do today um what are some of the ways that we can actually enjoy it more once we've in it you've talked mm -hmm. a little bit about how shame can affect that and how that kind of locks you up in your own brain. And we've talked on yeah. the show about the stories that your left brain makes up about your experience and and uh, that it's actually usually not based on reality. And if you're telling yourself those stories, you're probably not here right now. <laughs> um, how, how do you approach that that issue of, uh, of enjoying sex more? It's such a great question. And um, there is a lot of evidence that mindful sex is a research-backed way that people are enjoying sex more. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the main things to focus on is you want to be aware of what is happening at the moment, non-judgmentally. So that piece is so important. If we can bring some compassion in and try and decrease the amount of judgment that we feel about what we are, about all those things we talked about earlier, um, that is an essential piece because once we can calm the voices of judgment, we can be more available um, so we want to be present to what is happening as it is happening. And that sounds simple, but it is not, right? <laughs> it, like not, people no. spend years in meditation trying to cultivate that skill. 
Um, but one of the ways we can we can draw our attention into that is about is through paying attention to the sensations and the feelings that we're having as we're having them and focusing our attention on that instead of on those stories in our mind. Um, breath can always be a beautiful anchor to bring us back to our sensations and uh, the experience of pleasure or whatever we're feeling in our body, slight heat, slight warmth, you know, whatever you're feeling in your body and like putting your full attention on those sensations will really help a person come into paying attention to their own body. And that is a precursor to really enjoying the sex that we're having. Um, there are, of course, a lot of other pieces around that. For instance, like, are we having sex that we're enjoying? Are there a lot of things to make, to change and shift um, around making sure that the sex we're having is actually what we want to be having? Um, so that is a bigger, a bigger conversation where we're wanting to express our desires, know what we want, share it communicate, make adjustments. Um, there are a lot of skills in that. Uh, but then once we're in the sex that we hopefully are enjoying, it's really about paying attention to our sensations, which is not an easy thing to do. I, I want to just name that. that that's, no. It sounds simple, but it's, yeah. it's, we know it's not. Like that's a whole lifetime of work right there. Yeah, it really is. Um, yeah. I'm running a workshop right now called Taming Your Triggers, where we're looking at basically reparenting ourselves, <laughs> mm -hmm. like looking at it from the lens of, uh, okay, my child is doing something that is really, really causing me to feel triggered or flooded. What is the mm -hmm. ultimate cause of this? Um, and, and we start that work by paying attention to what we're feeling leading up to that feeling of being triggered or flooded and when it's actually happening so that we can use those physical sensations as a key mm. to say, okay, something's coming here. <laughs> I'm feeling that, that thing in my throat or that pit in my stomach. I know that something's about to happen. What, what can I do to shift things here? And when I'm talking with people who are in the workshop, you know, some of them will say, okay, I laid down and I paid attention to my my breath, like you mentioned, and I couldn't tell if I was breathing or if I was holding my breath. We, we have such a separation between our logical brain-based understanding and anything that happens below the neck that so, some people can't even tell if they're breathing or not when they're paying attention to it. So yeah, I, I just want to underscore what you're saying about it, it sounds so simple to just pay attention to what's happening in your body, but it is not it's simple at all. Totally. Absolutely. And then all the kind of things that we do in the rest of our life can, you know, we can have other practices in other parts of our life that then can support that feeling like an easier thing or something that we're practicing in mm -hmm. our bedrooms, you know, whether that's dance or movement, mm -hmm. um, exercise. Um, I mean, there's so many different ways we can like feel the sensations of our bodies and practice that in other spheres that will support us being able to feel more in bed. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is also a life, a lifetime of, of a practice mm -hmm. yeah. and to be gentle with ourselves around that. But calming yeah. the judgment is a great place to start. <laughs> For sure. Okay. So I'm wondering if we can maybe transition a little bit to, uh, conversations we're having with our children about sex and about pleasure. Mm -hmm. And, and so obviously we're not going to be going into intimate details about our sex lives with our children, but it seems as though there needs to be some balance between just talking about sex in the abstract and sex that we might be having. And the reason I thought of this was I was thinking back to a conversation I had with some neighbors of ours who moved away. Uh, they had a child at the time who was about nine. He was the oldest of three and he was just figuring out what sex is. And his, his mom reported to us that he said, I know you and dad have had sex at least three times. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, there is obviously a message there that's being passed on about sex and sex makes babies when you do it in some ways with some people. Um, but but surely there has to be more to that conversation. And, and how do we strike that balance where we're not, you know, telling everything that's completely inappropriate about our sex lives, but we're also not just conveying that it makes babies and make sure that doesn't happen before you're a certain age. Totally. Um, I mean, I think that so much can be shared with kids without actually sharing any details about our personal mm. sex life. I don't think the most kids do want to know about the details of their parents' sex life. Um, I think what's much more important is sharing the values that you hold around sexuality and sharing that. Um, and I think with kids, it's so important to really ask what the question is 
that they are um, asking mm -hmm. because we can sometimes like leap to a whole other thing that is very adult when they're asking <laughs> a completely different question and you really don't want to um, go down that route. So really like asking one or two questions um, and Sex Positive Families really talks about this strategy. They're a great website to yeah. um, explore. Melissa yeah. is amazing. Um, but so I think really find out what question they're asking um, and then ask follow-up questions so you can answer that specific question. And I think that you can most often do it without giving personal details. Because mm -hmm. um, I think most kids end up being kind of grossed out by that. Um, and that's okay. You know, it's it's more about what do we, what as a family are, are the values that we want to share. Mm. Well, just um, to pause on that point, isn't that sort of a cultural artifact in itself? I mean, there, there are many places around the world where children and parents live in the same bedrooms and there are yeah. many, many children. And so the children are probably seeing the parents have sex at some point. So it, isn't the idea of it being, of children being grossed out by sex sort of part of the shame that we're passing on through the generations? It could be. It also could be part of just differentiation and having boundaries. And um, they're kind of saying, well, this is my myself and that is you. And I don't really want to know more about that. And that's that's OK and appropriate, too. Um, so I don't know how much is cultural shame about that and how much is is appropriate developmental um growth i don't know question but, to add to my list for <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> for, i hope to get to talk more yeah. about <laughs> but um but i really do think you can answer a lot of questions without sharing personal details mm -hmm. and that that's okay okay um and so yeah we we talked with uh, a sex educator salima noon a while ago about um sort of how to have the basic conversations about sex and she mentioned one of the first things you can do is to say oh i'm so glad you asked that question tell, tell me more or why do you want to know and firstly that buys you some time totally. so that you can think <laughs> and you don't have to give the first response that pops into your mind um, and secondly yeah it allows you to clarify what is the child actually asking here and so that you can answer that question rather than uh something that you jump to that wasn't actually what they're asking um but but assuming you're um you know, you, we're, we're wanting to talk with our children about more than our culture normally does. Like pleasure, for example, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is, is just not a conversation that comes up. Uh, it, it may not even come up at school, maybe, if, if the kids are all getting the same message, none of which is about pleasure. And so, so maybe the child doesn't even know to ask. How, how are we going to have conversations with our children that helps them understand that yeah, sex is actually pleasurable and that's not something to be ashamed of. Wait, where would you start with that? I mean, I would also, I would start with teaching kids to experience their own pleasure. And I don't even necessarily mean in the self-touch realm, but I mean in all of life and at any age, I feel like it's a really, um, it can be really appropriate because you never have to actually even talk about sex. Mm you're are just beginning to give them the building blocks so that they can have an experience, a healthy sexuality when it is time for them. Um, and I really love that approach of like a pleasure-based education for our kids um, and teaching the skills that are essential. Things like being able to like know your own pleasure pathways. I mean, this can be in a non-sexual way, right? So how would um, you do that? What, what does that mean practically? So I feel like, for instance, like if there's extra time after a shower and there's before bedtime, we have massage lotion by our kid's bed and I'll just be like, do you want to take a few minutes and give yourself a massage um, while I finish cleaning the kitchen? So give her private space to just explore her own body in a way where she gets to know her own body and is touching her body and is feeling what feels good for her for no reason aside from it just feels good. Mm -hmm. But I'm making sure to leave so that she can kind of be in her own space around that. So like modeling privacy and um, yeah, her own her own autonomy around that. But like yeah. really normalizing that she can touch her own body and find out what feels good to her. Okay. Um, what kind of age of child are you thinking about here? I mean, we started doing that when she was like four, five, six. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah. Did, how does she know what to do? Like if I said to my six-year-old, do you want to give yourself a massage? She'd look, she'd look at me and she'd be like, what? <laughs> how do you start that? Um, I guess that's because I guess we've been doing this kind of thing um, <laughs> since birth. So yeah, um, I, <laughs> those of us who are arriving are yeah. a little bit late. <laughs> no, never too late. Never too late. Never too late. 
I mean, I guess I she's seen me give myself massage uh, um, okay. because that is a practice that I do to cultivate my own experience of my own pleasure pathways. Uh-huh. Um, after a shower, I'll just give myself a massage. So I guess there uh-huh. have been moments where maybe in parallel. So I've just kind of like showed like what I do. Um, in other moments, we've given her foot massage or back massage. Mm-hmm. Um, and in those moments, I really make sure to say, you know, if this stops feeling good, you let me know if you're ready to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, let me know if you want me to do more pressure or less pressure or faster or slower. Mm-hmm. And I'm really clear in those moments that I'm training her to expect this level of attentiveness and respecting her boundaries mm-hmm. and that that is assumed that yeah. that is that is how you start um and it can just be like on the foot or the back you know you can keep it super appropriate and um not confusing and i think i think those things really matter so she like knows knows her own body knows how to so she knows in her mouth how to say that thank you i'm done now you can stop now um can you add a little bit more pressure that doesn't feel good can you go over there i mean she mm. can do all of that Wow. Um, at six. And I feel like it's just been very organic. Yeah. It's not like really didactic. It's just like a, you know, even if I'm like rubbing her back when I'm reading a book, I will just mm-hmm. always say like, you let me know when you're done or if you want me to move anywhere, just kind of adding these pieces in. So there's the consent, but there is pleasure and voice around how to communicate about that. Oh, that's super helpful. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the self-massage, because I I think I remember hearing about that once somewhere before, that it's something that you should do. And whenever Mm. I'm just kind of swiping lotion on myself, I always think, yeah, there was something about massage I was supposed to be doing, and I don't remember what it was or I know how to do it. Um, How would you get started with self-massage in in a a non-sexual way? Oh, my God. Well, first of all, it's like one of my favorite things in the entire world. Oh, really? Yeah, I like love it. It's super part of my like responsive desire. Uh, ex- like I prepare for my own sex life partly by having a shower, putting up like self massage and then uh-huh. dancing because all of that like helps me get into my own experience uh-huh. of my own body so I can feel my sensations more. Um, I love it. It's like, Im- it's so important to me. So for self, yeah, taking, and it's also a way of practicing mindful, like it, it is, you're paying attention to the sensations as they're happening. And it can be a practice of that. So just after the shower, when you're putting on your lotion, just, you know, you can put on a song if you want to like add more jazz to it, but you don't need to, um, don't make things more complicated if that doesn't add things, but just taking a few more minutes to really feel the contours of your skin. Mm. This is the boundary of your body. This is the boundary of where you stop and the world's starts you know it is like you're just how much care love attention nourishment can you pour into your own skin like how can you love yourself as you wish you would be touched um and you can bring as much like reverence or devotion or just more casual like caring touch depending on your mood like it doesn't have to be a whole production again um but it can be you know sometimes i'll take an hour and do like the candle lit the thing all just for myself because i find it incredibly nourishing and it helps me get into my own body and it this like pleasure as a resource to like like tone my vagus nerve like calm my nervous system mm-hmm feel better so that I'm like more nourished and can like contribute to the people around me more fully. Okay. And there was, there's a time of parenting where I didn't do it as much and I did feel much more depleted. Hmm. Um, so does that answer your question? It's really um, just well, about I taking- I want to know like, what should, what should I be doing? Should it, does it look like just kind of stroking your arm or is it giving more pressure? Like as if you were giving somebody else a massage, it usually has more pressure than, uh-huh. than just kind of stroking. Like what is it actually, what are you doing for an hour? <laughs> I love it. Well, so it can be either of those. One can be more of a muscular massage, like where you're really like, yeah, where you're as if somebody else was massaging you, where you're really finding the areas of tension. You're exploring with your hands, like where are the places of tension? Where does it feel a little knotty? Where does it feel a little crunchy? Mm -hmm. And you can kind of put a little more pressure there. It's such a good way of practicing massage to give to a lover also, because you can have the experience of what it feels like inside your body and the experience of what the muscles feel like. So yes, you can do more muscular massage to really like find areas of tension. Of course, so many of us have them in the shoulders and you're using, you can use deep pressure and uh, really like pull your hand down. So you're using weight instead of your muscular strength of your hands. Um, You can massage your scalp, you can massage your belly, your breasts, like less in terms of a muscular way, but in terms of like a lymphatic kind of just pulling up towards the um, armpits, just so that you're like moving everything around and you in doing that you begin to feel yourself more Mm. 
Um, cause you're, yeah. Um, belly massage. I love to do circles on my belly M more often lying down than standing up. Um, legs, cut, foot massage is like dreamy. That's if I have five minutes, I'll just do like a few minutes of foot massage on my feet and it makes such a difference to your whole body. Mm. Um, so yes, muscular, or if you just want to feel relaxed, like the like gliding over your skin can be really just relaxing and nourishing in a different kind of way. Okay, good to know. <laughs> that, any of that answer any of the questions? Yeah, for like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I think, yeah, now I, now I can actually concretely see like what is it that I should be trying when I'm trying something like that. So, But of course, it's always about what is pleasurable to you. Like right. the question is always what do I feel, ple yeah. what, what feels pleasurable to me and what do I feel like right now? Like right. what will be nourishing to me right now? And in different moments, it'll feel different. And it's such a good place to practice that, answering that question for ourselves with no pressure, yeah. no right, wrong. Just again, it's a pleasure inquiry. Yeah. Although I could also imagine shame being an issue in those moments as well, potentially when you are so focused on your own body <laughs> and things don't look the way they once did. And there's evidence of children. <laughs> um, do you have something that you say to yourself in those moments or that you suggest that people say to themselves or like what is a sort of a, a regrounding practice that people can use when they are so focused on themselves and then they're like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I wish this didn't look the way it does or didn't feel the way it does. Well, then I think it's really valuable to shift from what it looks like to how it feels. Okay. And this is where like, how can we drop into how it feels? Because our body, no matter what it looks like, is a vessel for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And all of us have an ability to access pleasure, um, no matter what, what, where we're at on our pleasure journey, um, no matter what has happened to us. So I feel like it's shifting from what we look like to how we feel. Um, and also coming into body neutrality. Like we don't have to shift from not liking our body and being frustrating it to being like, I have the most beautiful body in the whole world. That might not be like realistic for people, but can we go to neutrality of like, here is my body. This is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Here I am at this moment in time. This is what my body looks like. Can I give myself care and love and attention here? Because I am here. You know, how can we just be with what is mm -hmm. and have that be okay? And enough, like our body is enough, even though culture has told us it should look like something else. We, yeah, we do have a good podcast episode on this. If um, you want a link to that, that is really about body, like how to, I can't quite remember what it's about, but it's like, you know, how to love you. I can't remember what it's about, but it's a really solid one that we've got great feedback. Yeah. <laughs> well, because it's, this is such a, such a central issue for people, yeah. especially post child birth um, or having a kid, you know, it's, it's, it's enormous. So yeah, just being with ourselves. What a lovely way to end. <laughs> so I wonder, par parents are probably thinking, okay, I need some more pleasure mechanics in my life. <laughs> and you've only heard one half of the duo. You haven't even heard the sultry voice from Chris yet. <laughs> um, and so can you tell parents where to find you and your resources and also about your free course that you offer for parents who are looking to kickstart some stuff in this arena? Thank you. Yes, we are over at pleasuremechanics.com um, and pleasuremechanics.com slash free is where you will find um, our erotic essentials course, which is brings you into just sorts of all sorts of basics and essentials that we feel like are really important to unlearn what we need to unlearn and start building a more powerful framework to be really enjoying the pleasure that we can access in life um, and to be experiencing better sex. Like there are all these different shifts that we can make that are quite simple once we, once we know them and can have a really big difference in our life. Mm -hmm. So please do come over to pleasuremechanics.com slash free. And I know that the um, links will be in the show notes page, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. Along with references <laughs> from stuff we've talked about today. So thank you so much for being here, Charlotte. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. A, a pleasure in, <laughs> in so many ways. Um, and I think this is such an important episode for parents for themselves, for their own fulfillment, as well as to start mm. having different kinds of conversations with their children. So thanks for, for doing the amazing work that you do. And I'm so glad that I found you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm so grateful to your listeners to be caring about this and to like really making a change in their children's lives and like 
you know, we all wish we could have gotten a different kind of pleasure in sex education, I am sure. And so how can we offer that to our children and what a gift that is? So I thank parents for like putting in that time and effort and doing the unlearning that we have to do in order to be able to be those parents that can shame-free say the word vulva and encourage <laughs> kids to not feel as much shame in their own body. All right. Well, all of the references that we've discussed on today's show, as well as the links to Chris and Charlotte's podcast and to the uh, free erotic essentials course can be found at yourparentingmojo.com forward slash pleasure mechanics. Mm-hmm.